morning, everyone, and welcome to. Uh, we give you a warm welcome to worship this morning, and if you're a visitor, you're most welcome as you join with us. Tea and coffee is available in the main hall after the service, and everyone is welcome. If you feel you would like to engage in prayer after this morning's service, a member of our prayer team will be available in the committee room. Um, there's only one, uh, there's an, an announcement about a night at the movies, which is on Friday the 26th of April. Tickets for this, are, this event are still available. So if you haven't got yours, please see Claire, who's over here, Melanie or Heather Laird in the main hall after the service this morning. It should be an excellent evening showcasing the talent of many of our own members. Um, I think that's all of the announcements this morning, except just to give a very warm word of welcome to the Reverend Norman Macaulay, recently retired minister of Greenwell Street in Newtonards, who will be conducting our service this morning. Um, as he leads worship, we thank him for being with us. Uh, and I just hand over, that over to him now. Um, and as you can see, or perhaps know this morning, we're going to have a link up with Recife, hopefully uh, at the, the reading of the service. So we hope that that all will go well this morning. So thank you very much to Reverend Macaulay. I hand it over to him now. Well, Mary, thank you very much for your warm welcome here this morning, and indeed to Andrew for his very kind invitation to be with you. I have uh, conducted a funeral service here once, so that's my only previous time to have been uh, here in the church, but it's lovely to be back again, and I thank Andrew very much, and we'll be remembering him in prayer later on in the service. The psalmist writes, I will praise you, O Lord, among the nations. I will sing of you among the peoples. For great is your love, higher than the heavens. Your faithfulness reaches to the skies. Be exalted, O God, above the heavens, and let your glory be over all the earth. Let us bow in prayer as we approach Almighty God. Our gracious God and our loving Heavenly Father, the one in whom we live and move and have our being, the one who is from everlasting to everlasting, the one who sustains all things, having created them by the word of his mouth, we come together to worship you. You alone are God. There is none beside you. You are the eternal God who in great love and mercy has made himself known to us. We see your handiwork in the world about us. The psalmist tells us the heavens declare your glory. And on a day like this, we look and we wonder and we marvel and we say, surely a creator's hand has designed all this. And we thank you, O Lord, that you're the God who's looked upon us in mercy for you have come to us in the person of your Son, Jesus Christ. You have come that you might bring us from the darkness of our sin, the hopelessness of our sin, into that vital and living relationship with yourself through him. And so knowing our sins forgiven and knowing his righteousness credited to us by faith, we have that wonderful assurance that day by day we live under the shadow of your care, until that day when our earthly pilgrimage is done and we, through him, are gathered into your nearer presence. We pray that something of eternity will be known and felt among us as we gather here this morning and that our worship may truly come from our hearts and be to the honor, the glory, and the praise of our great and glorious God through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. Well, we join to sing together a setting of the lovely psalm, How Lovely Is Thy Dwelling Place.
Now, this is where we put ourselves in the hands of technology and the technicians offering it. So we're trusting that we'll be able to have connection with Andrew and that he is going to read the Word of God to us from Brazil. Olá. Bom dia. It's great to be able to join with you this morning. I'm not going to say too much about how things have been going because if I get started, I'll go for quite a while. But it's been a wonderfully encouraging time so far. Uh, Brazilian hospitality is a marvel to behold. Um, the gifts that have come out from Cumber and from the wider community have been really very greatly appreciated. You've maybe seen some photos or videos on Facebook that have uh, testified to that. So thank you all very much indeed. Uh, now we're here together from God's Word as we find it in Luke chapter 2, picking up at verse 41 and reading through to verse 52. Now his parents went to Jerusalem every year at the feast of the Passover. And when he was 12 years old, they went up according to custom. And when the feast was ended, as they were returning, the boy Jesus stayed behind in Jerusalem. His parents did not know it, but supposing him to be in the group, they went a day's journey. But then they began to search for him among their relatives and acquaintances. And when they did not find him, they returned to Jerusalem, searching for him. After three days, they found him in the temple, sitting among the teachers, listening to them and asking them questions. And all who heard him were amazed at his understanding and his answers. And when his parents saw him, they were astonished. And his mother said to him, Son, why have you treated us so? Behold, your father and I have been searching for you in great distress. But he said to them, Why were you looking for me? Did you not know that I must be in my father's house? And they did not understand the saying that he spoke to them. And he went down with them and came to Nazareth and was submissive to them. And his mother treasured up these things in her heart. And Jesus increased in wisdom and stature and in favor with God. Amen. We thank God for his living, trustworthy word. Amen. Well, that was lovely. Uh, Eleanor Hutchinson is going to come and speak to us just about the work of the Banner Group. Thank you very much, Eleanor. Can you hear me okay? Good morning, everyone. It's lovely to be somewhat, if somewhat daunting, to be up here and speaking, but it's wonderful to have the opportunity to talk for a few minutes about the Banner Group and our mission outreach. I feel it would be of interest to give a quick review of our journey as a group, which, following permission for my request to Reverend Mackey and Session to start a Banner Group, this was granted and we were formed in 2015. We asked Reverend Mackey if he would have any suggestions for the first two banners, and he chose from Revelation, King of Kings and Lord of Lords. So that was the start of our journey and led us to sewing and designing banners relating to the different seasons in church life. 2017, 2018, we were indebted to John Ritchie and his premises team who had the foresight to get built for us custom made cupboards to house the banners. 2019, we had made 26 banners and decided we would embark on a month-long festival of banners advertising through Christian Herald. There were many challenges, namely how to hang 26 banners without driving in nails to walls, which was a complete no-no. Thankfully, John and his team had the determination and ethos of how to do this rather than we can't do this. And you can talk, you can ask John and his team how they did it. As you know, would know, the Banner Group were continually praying about these obstacles, and we're so thankful that God answered many prayers we prayed during the whole festival. It was a blessed time for us, 
as many excited groups came from all artisan parts, and we were amazed that as well as enjoying hosting and chatting to the groups, we were actually, through the banners, encouraging them to start sewing banners for their own churches. We were able, through that work, to give £1,000 to the Met to help with their work in community, and £1,000 to James and Heather Cochran for their mission work in Portugal, and 1800 to the church funds. The banners are all scripture verses, and the verse from Psalm 20 says, we will lift up our banners in the name of our God. And that is what we see as our mission of our banner group to our congregation here at Second Cumber. The banners... I personally find the wonderful thing about that is that when you sometimes can't find the words to pray, the verse will lead you naturally into praying scripture. For instance, our two banners which we completed for Lent were taken from Isaiah 53 verse of Isaiah 5, 53. And that is a very powerful verse. He was pierced for our transgressions. He was crushed for our iniquities. The punishment that brought us peace was on him. And by his wounds we are healed. The companion banner to that was from the New Testament. And hundreds of years had passed in between those times. It simply repeated the words of Jesus on the cross. It is finished. And along the bottom, paid in full. When we read those verses, how could we fail to thank God for the sacrifice of his son and the suffering he endured for us and the hope that we have of eternal life in him? And we had the two banners from Easter proclaiming the triumphant verses of he is risen and hallelujah. The two banners that are up now are the spring banners and reminds me of planting seeds. Firstly, of the minister preaching the gospel and all our organizations from tots onwards planting seeds into the hearts and lives of our children through music, memory verses, games, and, and just playing things, and, and also coloring in books. Building firm foundations for them to negotiate their journey in life through this world. Secondly, they remind me of the plight and hardships which our farmers are now going through at this present time, and pray that we will all be led into continually lifting them up in prayer for them for their health, strength, mental well-being, and for God's provision for them at this time. And bearing in mind that God makes the harvest grow. We have 10 ladies in our group, and I'm not going to embarrass them by saying their names, but they will be in the yearbook. We have a great fellowship together, and uh, we work together to sow as a team, and doing that, it enables us to make the banners and fund, self-fund them ourselves. So now we are looking forward to hosting the coffee and wellness morning, and we hope we will. We hope you will support us, and hope it will be of benefit to you practically, physically, and spiritually to all that come along. Um, I'm just going to say a wee word about this now. Um, I don't know if you've received this wee leaflet. It was last week, and if you want any more, I have them. Uh, there's different groups coming. There's diabetic, NE, arthritis. There's a whole list, dementia, community police, homestead. All of those people are coming for their services. And if you want to um, get any information on those, they will provide it. They'll also give a wee information presentation at the start, which is at half ten. Some of them will be given a wee rota if you want your blood pressure taken or if you want a facial. Those wee things. So I would say come at half ten and get your name on the rota. There also is... For us spiritually is, uh, we're going to do, Sarah has conducted a prayer walk and a quiet time here in church. And I'll just ask Sarah if she wouldn't mind mentioning this. Just elaborate on it. Okay, Sarah. Thank you. Morning. Um, some of you maybe have come to one of the prayer walks before and maybe some of you have not. So I will talk to the people who've never been to one before and try and explain a wee bit about what it is. Um, I think it'll take place in here in the church building, will it? Yeah, well, yes. In 
somewhere. Um, and what it is, is just like a little station set about that will take you on a wee walk through the church and back out. Um, and I've decided, Eleanor gave me the words for the coffee more than ages ago, and she said uh, wellness and awareness. So I took a bit of artistic license and ran with the word awareness. And was thinking about things in society that make us aware. Um, and for that, I came up with like road signs and diff how different road signs make us aware of things. Um, so if you want to come and see how I've tried really badly to get them to mix in uh, with Bible verses, you can come and have a walk around church um, and see how the Bible um, brings things to our awareness, wants us to be aware of things. Um, if you have never been to a, like a prayer walk or prayer space before, um, it's not, nobody's looking at you and nobody's watching you and I'm not judging to see how long you're taking to go around it. And some people read faster than other people and some people want to stand and some people don't. Um, my children will be with me, so how quiet it'll be as well will be another thing. Um, but it's just, everybody prays, hopefully. Sometimes you get stuck in a bit of a rut and you find it hard to think of new things to pray for. And these spaces are maybe to try and be an encouragement to get you to think of things that you have maybe not think, thought about before and to try and maybe get you to help you know, form your prayer life a little bit differently maybe for a while. Um, you would be very welcome to come. Um, I don't take a rota and I don't tell, say who's there or not. Um, and if you come and have buns, you know, like you can come and have the wee walk around after and then you feel less bad about eating the buns. Um, yeah, so I'm looking forward to the morning. It'll be lovely to see you there. Thank, thank you. Thank you very much, Sarah. Thank you very much and thank you, everybody. Thank you. Thank you, Reverend. Well, thank you very much, uh, Eleanor and Sarah. Now continue our worship of God together in our offering. Our gracious God, the giver of every good and perfect gift, we praise you for every way in which you enrich our lives and bless us in temporal things and in spiritual things. And we thank you for the privilege of giving back as you have given to us. And we pray, Lord, that not only will these gifts be used for the prospering of your kingdom, but indeed in the hearts and minds of the givers there may be an enrichment in their own souls as they give of themselves and their substance to you and to your service. Receive this then to your glory in Jesus' name. Amen. <laughs> the boys and girls like to come to the front. Right, good morning. Good morning. Now tell me, do you ever get invited to a party? Ever get invited to a party? What sort of party do you get invited to? Huh? I'm going to the party today. Yeah, what? You're going to a party today? I didn't get an invitation to that party. 
Hi everyone, lovely to see you. Do you ever get invitations to parties? Parties? What sort of parties? Football parties? I've never been to a football party. Anybody been to a birthday party? Yeah, of course, that's the sort of thing. I wonder if, you, for, if something happened and you weren't able to get to the birthday party, I wonder what you would miss most. What would you miss most? Friends. Your friends? Yeah, you would. You would miss having a good time with them and playing the games and all with them, wouldn't you? I, I Anything know, else? What else? What else? The birthday bag. The birthday bag. <laughs> hey, you get that when you're going home, but You get that when you're going home, don't you? What else? Cake. Oh, I always miss the cake, wouldn't you? Right, so you would miss things, wouldn't you? If you okay, uh, any of you, anybody ever have a Christmas party? Maybe the Sunday school of a Christmas party, do they? Or the GB or BB, do you? You have a Christmas party, do you? Well, say you weren't able to get to the Christmas party. What would you miss most about not being at the Christmas party? What do you think? Spending time with other people, that's a lovely answer. Chocolate. I would miss that too, so would. Christmas cake. Christmas cake, and Christmas cake. cake lovely. Cake. Is that right? Yes. Presents. Presents? Who might you get presents from? Santa. Never. Would you? Santa. Would you? Would you miss Santa if you weren't at a Christmas party? You might do. That would that'd be sad, wouldn't it? So you miss things. If you're not at something, you miss. You miss your friends, you miss your cake, you maybe miss getting your presents. What if you weren't able to get to church this morning? What would you have missed about being at church? Listening more. Listening, very good, and very important thing to do, yes. Um, listening to the service. Listening to the service, right. You'd miss children's church, would you? Yeah, it's great being with your friends. The buns. The buns. <laughs> uh, have you had those already? Have you had those already? No, are they still to come? Wow, that's exciting. Anybody, would anybody miss the singing? I would miss the singing, so would. I love singing these hymns, so I do. I love singing hymns. Would anyone miss meeting with other people? Yeah, because church isn't the building, church is the people, isn't it? We're part of the church as, as the people. But you know the person you would miss most of all? Who's the person you would miss most of all if you weren't here? What were we going to say? God, yes, or Jesus, isn't that right? Jesus said something quite wonderful, boys and girls. He said, we're two or three people are met together, I'm among them. I'm among them. I'm with them in a very special way. And you see, if you were to miss coming to church, one of the things you would miss is miss having the opportunity to meet with others and to meet with Jesus. Now, we don't see him. Sure, we don't. He's at the right hand of his Father in glory, but his Holy Spirit is with us. He's present with us by his Holy Spirit. And you see, the most important one we would miss if we don't come to church is that we would miss that very special meeting with Jesus. Because that's why we're here today, isn't it? We're here to worship God. We're here to thank Jesus for all he has done for us on the cross, as Eleanor was reminding us a little earlier there as well. And so I want you to remember that. There are things that you might miss about birthdays, about Christmas parties, but the one thing you would miss if you weren't at church is you would miss meeting with the risen Lord Jesus Christ who's with us today. And that's the most exciting thing of all. He's with us and he sees you and he knows everything about you and he loves you and he wants to care for you and he wants you to grow up knowing and loving him and knowing he's with you every step of the way. So let's have a brief prayer as we ask the Lord for his help. Father, we thank you that though we cannot see Jesus, we know he is here by his Holy Spirit because he said he would be, that we're two or three boys and girls, two or three grown-ups, were met together in his name. There he would be among them. So we thank you you're with us today. We thank you you'll be with the children in Children's Church. 
And we ask that as they learn from your word, so your Holy Spirit would be their teacher, helping them to understand more about Jesus, love him more, and want to serve him more day by day. We leave them in your care and ask your blessing upon them. In Jesus' name, amen, amen. No, I didn't bring Mashik down with me. What are we saying? Big family of God. Big family of God. We're joined to sing together. Let us bow together in prayer. Let us pray. Our loving Father, through our Lord Jesus Christ, you have opened up for us a new and a living way whereby we may come boldly under the throne of grace, there to find grace to help us in our time of need. And Lord, we are constantly needy people. The hymn writer rightly penned the words, we need you every hour, we need you. Indeed, the truth is, Lord, we need you every moment. For it is you who blesses us with every breath. It is you who keeps us alive. It is you who keeps us well. We come to you today conscious that you are God, the sovereign Lord of heaven and earth, the one who orders, ordains all things. You are the one in whom we live, move, have our being. You are the one who has appointed our days before one of them has come to be. You are the one who is able to do far beyond all that we ask and can even imagine. We come to you today, Lord, to be praying for the needs of others, and particularly at this time, we have the Middle East upon our minds with these recent attacks by Iran, and conscious, O Lord, that this could be the touch paper to ignite a a terrible holocaust 
in that part of the world. We're praying that there will be wisdom and restraint by world leaders, that, Lord, some way will be found to resolve all the issues that have rumbled on for hundreds and hundreds of years. And we pray, loving Father, for your church as she bears witness in these most difficult of situations, as she speaks of the one who alone can bring true peace within our hearts and true peace between people, and that is the Prince of Peace himself, our Lord Jesus. May your people be courageous in the face of the challenges that they have, and that, Lord, may their lives testify to a Savior who loves and a Savior who cares. We continue to remember the ongoing conflict in the Ukraine and, of course, many other places throughout our world where there's constant pressures and tensions and conflict not only on global scale and internationally, but sadly, Lord, very often conflict within communities, conflict within families. We turn to you conscious that you alone are the one who can reconcile us to yourself and to one another. We come praying for Andrew today, thankful that the video link worked and good to know that things are going well and he's greatly encouraged. And as a congregation, we look forward very much to him sharing more about this on his return. We pray you'll continue to keep him well and safe and that his ministry might be greatly used by yourself in blessing those dear folk in Brazil and asking Lord God that the gifts they've received may be a testimony to them of the love of Jesus for them. We come to pray as a congregation for those who are in need, especially those led aside, sickness or illness, perhaps in a hospital at present, those unable to be with us now, infirmity, immobility has meant they're confined to home or maybe in a care home. But we thank you, Lord, that doors and walls do not keep you out, and so we ask that you would draw near to them today, and particularly those who are unable to be here and so are sharing with us on the live feed. May they know your gracious presence, and may they know your help in the face of their challenges. We pray for ourselves, for as we come, Lord, we're reminded that you know everything about each of us. You know our needs, you know our yearnings, you know our disappointments, you know our anxieties. We pray that by the grace of your Holy Spirit, you would speak into all our lives words of comfort, words of peace, words of hope. And may Jesus be lifted up among us so that beholding him in all his glory, we might be drawn to know and acknowledge him as our Savior and as our friend. Grant to us then the grace of your Holy Spirit as we turn now shortly to your word and bless its truth to our hearts and minds for the sake of our Lord Jesus Christ in whose strong and saving name we pray. Amen. Well, let us join to sing together before we turn to the word of God, Jesus, all for Jesus.
Well, if you have your Bible with you or access to one, please open it to Luke chapter 2, the passage that Andrew read for us earlier, and we're going to work our way uh, through this. I'm, I'm sure we're all familiar with the problems that arise when we make assumptions. Maybe we assume somebody else switched off the heater, or maybe we assumed somebody else set the oven for your dinner, or maybe we assumed you had enough petrol in the car to get us to where we are going. And we know the problems that can arise when we make those sorts of assumptions. But in many of those cases, a wrong assumption isn't the end of the world. But there are times when making an assumption can prove disastrous. You may have assumed 12 foot up that ladder that it was well grounded and secure. And it's too late finding that out once you're 12 feet up the ladder. There are many situations. The roads, you assumed they would be okay and they were icy. Many things that an assumption can have disastrous consequences. But there is, of course, one way in making an assumption can have eternal consequences. And that is the danger of assuming you're a Christian. The danger of assuming you're a Christian. And that's why we're looking at this passage in Luke chapter 2. Now, why is this so important? Well, it's important because Jesus Christ himself paints for us this very tragic picture on, on different occasions during his public ministry of those who, in the day of judgment, will find that all along they've been making a wrong assumption. You'll be familiar with the words of Jesus. Many will say to me in that day, Lord, Lord, did we not cast out demons in your names and do mighty works in your names? And what will Jesus say to them? I never knew you. Depart from me. Or the parable he taught of the bridesmaids. Remember, some of them were ready, waiting for the bridegroom to arrive. Some of them decided to go down to the eight to late just to get some snack or whatever it was. But when they returned, the doors were shut and they were kept out. They assumed there wouldn't be a problem getting back. See, Jesus warns us of the awful possibility of being eternally disappointed eternally shut out from God's presence, all because we assumed something. And so I hope that as we look at this passage today in Luke chapter 2, it will highlight, if it's true of you, the danger you're in, and will encourage you to ensure that you no longer make an assumption, but you make sure. I wonder what they were talking about. Joseph and Mary and the crowd. They'd gone up to the feast. It was the tradition. This is the first feast Jesus had gone to because he was now 12. He was, in Jewish law, a man. And so he had to attend the feast. And so he's there. And it was no unusual thing for families and communities to travel together. You will know the parable of the Good Samaritan. Where does it take place? It takes place on the road to Jerusalem from Jericho, doesn't it? The roads were dangerous places. They often had to go through hills and valleys. And so they traveled in groups, safety in numbers. We're familiar with that. And of course, extended families knew each other, communities knew each other. You know, in the way, two or three generations back, and if you're from Cumber, you knew everybody in Cumber, and you knew everything about them, and you knew their granny, and knew everything else about them. It's different now, isn't it? But in those days, you knew the whole community. That's what it was like. I wonder what they were talking about. What were you talking about when you were coming to worship this morning? Talking about the weather, you're maybe thinking, ah, the far better rather be in the north coast a day like that than going to church. Or maybe you were talking about Rory McElroy, how poor he's doing in the Masters again. Or maybe you were talking about the terrible scenario that's unfolding in the Middle East with Iran's assault. Well, I'm sure these ordinary, everyday things were being discussed by this group of people years ago. They'd come to Jerusalem for one of the great feasts, and now the celebration's all over, 
they were heading for home. The conversation in the crowd was all about the weather. It was maybe about Rome, the occupying power. But all the while, they were assuming something. Listen to it in Luke's gospel. After the feast was over, while his parents were returning home, the boy Jesus stayed in Jerusalem, but they were unaware of it. Thinking, assuming he was in their company, they traveled on for a day. So let's ask ourselves, first question, on what grounds do people make such a false assumption? As Joseph and Mary leave Jerusalem for home, they were unaware that Jesus was not with them. They assumed he would be part of the crowd. They assumed he was walking along with the boys of his own age. They assumed he would be having conversation, chat, and fun with them, but they never checked. They never checked. They just assumed he would be there, and this is quite common, particularly in nominal Christian countries. We assume because we have had that sort of Christian upbringing, we were brought to or were sent to church, and we feel that we have some connection with the Christian faith through that. We were maybe baptized as an infant or even as an adult. We perhaps even have come in to membership of the church. We're maybe regularly here week by week. And on all these grounds, we can make that sort of assumption that, well, I do all the things that a Christian ought to do. Or perhaps it's the life you live And you think, well, it's not a bad life. And the truth is, of course, we could look in the newspapers, we could look in the televisions, we could always find somebody who we're better than. In fact, we could find millions of people who we're better than in terms of how we live our lives. And we think, well, surely that that qualifies me. Surely this good life is an evidence. This is a Christian thing, a good life, isn't it? And maybe... Your assumption has been, well, you know, I've been taught from the very beginning that God is love. And God will not do all those things. I mean, if God loves me, he's not, going to, he's not going to do that. He's not going to cast me away. And so you assume that you'll be welcomed into heaven. And these are the grounds that people make these false assumptions. And, and this may be one of the grounds that you're making that assumption on today. It's one of the advantages of being in a congregation. I can't say I don't know anybody because I I know four people. But I wonder, is that the basis upon your which you're making an assumption? It was the Apostle Paul who, when he was writing to the church in Corinth, he reminded them, and remember, he was writing as he opens his letter to the saints in Corinth, He then later in that letter, as a final warning, says, examine yourselves to see whether you are in the faith. Test yourselves. Do you not realize that Christ Jesus is in you unless, of course, you fail the test? But further, they had gone a day's journey, we're told, in Luke 2, before they realized anything was wrong. So the second thing, a false assumption gives a false sense of well-being. As Joseph and Mary went on talking with their fellow travelers, blissfully unaware that Jesus wasn't with them behind. He was was happy. They were enjoying the company. They were enjoying the conversation. They were enjoying the crack as they went along. You see, they were blissfully unaware that Jesus wasn't there, and so they had this false sense of everything being well. Well, They assumed everything was great, everything was fine, that had a wonderful celebration in Jerusalem. But Jesus wasn't there. We have examples in the Bible, don't we? For example, Noah, the warning of the flood. And we're talking not just a week's notice, we're talking 120 years' notice. And Noah, we're told by Peter, was a preacher of righteousness. So he was preaching, warning the people to flee from the wrath which was to come. But they laughed and they mocked and they sneered and they jeered and everything else at him until the rain started to fall and the door was shut and it was too late. You see, they all had a sense of well-being until it was too late. Or Sodom and Gomorrah with their flagrant sin 
pretending God didn't notice. It was too late. You see, it is possible not just to travel one day in life. It is possible for you to have raced, raced, raced your stage in life without realizing there's something wrong. <clears throat> and then it would be too late. But the test is now to come. Because if false assumptions are made on the basis of grounds I've given you or give a sense of well-being, false assumptions, thirdly, are all you have when you need Jesus. Picture the scene. As a parent, grandparent, you may well have experienced this yourself. You're out with a child, out with a grandchild, you're in one of the bigger shopping centers, and all of a sudden, little Jimmy, we Sarah, they're not there. And the blind panic you go into, wondering where they've got to. Joseph and Mary realize after this day, possibly stopping to rest and then beginning to look for Jesus, this is when they realize Jesus is not with them. Now, what do you think became the priority? The latest football scores? The political situation? The weather? None of those things mattered. None of them. The only thing that mattered all of a sudden was, where's Jesus? Where's Jesus? And you know, friends, a moment like that arrives in all of our lives. A moment when the only thing that matters is, is Jesus with me in this? This is where Paul, I think, says, examine yourself to see if you're in the faith. Because you see, this faith isn't just a head knowledge, though it involves knowledge. But it is a heart commitment. Ask yourself the question, is Jesus with you? Well, how would you know? Do you know and enjoy his presence? Why, I spoke to the children about being in church. What's church about? It's about meeting with the risen Christ. That's not just something we celebrate on an Easter Sunday. We celebrate that every single Lord's Day. The risen Christ is among us. And yet we act as though we're just gathering together, motley crowd, and hoping there'll be something the preacher will say that'll send us on our way feeling happy. You know, the wonder of worship is Christ is with us. He's present with us. If you believe the Bible, then you at least believe Jesus' words where two or three are gathered together in my name. There I am in the midst of them. On the evening of his resurrection, what do you read? The disciples were met together with the doors locked for fear of the Jews, and Jesus came and stood in their midst and said, Peace be with you. Do you know and enjoy his presence? When you're facing difficulties, where do you turn? Is prayer with you the first resort or the last resort? That is, you only turn to pray and ask for help whenever all your own efforts have come to no, no avail. But when you're facing decisions, choices, young people, university courses, work, life partner, does Jesus have any say in that in your life? Do you look to him for his guidance and help? And what when we're facing illness? And what when we're facing death? Will you know his comfort? Will you know that sure hope that is part and parcel of the Christian faith? And what when you and I face judgment? Will you be able to own him as your savior in that day? You see, at such times, a false assumption will be no use to us at all. Jesus, all for Jesus. He's the one that matters. False assumptions, assumptions are all you have when you need Jesus. So the last question is, what do you do when you realize you've made this false assumption? 
Well, what did Joseph and Mary do? Well, they certainly didn't say, see that young lad? He'll catch up with us sometime. Well, just wait, he'll turn up. He's somewhere. So is that the way you would act as a parent or grandparent in a shopping center or in another city that you're visiting and you lose sight of a child? (laughs) Indeed not. When they did not find him, verse 45, they went back to Jerusalem to look for him. After three days they find him. Three days. And I'm quite sure they didn't go to sleep. They didn't book into the local travel lodge for a doze. That was 24-7, looking for him. Where could he be? Where could he be? The only thing that mattered was finding Jesus. And perhaps this morning, the Lord has enabled you to see that this is the mistake you've been making. You've been assuming, assuming. And the only thing that matters is that you need to find Jesus. And yet this is what the gospel is all about. It's good news. What was it Jesus said? Whoever comes to me, I will never turn away. My sheep will hear my voice, and they'll follow me, and I'll give them eternal life, and they will never perish. You see, this is why we need Jesus. We need him in life. We need him in death. And we need him to stand before God in judgment. And to only have an assumption in those situations helps us no way at all. It is having Jesus that makes all the difference. I don't know if you're familiar. Well, you'll know of the Pilgrim's Progress. I'm not sure if you're familiar with it, but it's one of those wonderful books that was written, John Bunyan in prison in Bedford, using dreams that he had to pen a marvelous explanation to us of the Christian life. And he says this toward the end of his book. It's a lengthy quote, but bear with me. Now, while I was gazing upon all these things, I turned my head to look back and saw ignorance come up to the riverside. He got over, and that without half the difficulty which the other two men had met with. For it happened that there was one in that place, a ferryman called Vain Hope. So he, as the other I saw, did ascend the hill to come to the gate. Only he came alone. Neither did any man meet him with the least encouragement. And when he was come to the gate, he looked to the writing of his above, began to knock, supposing an entrance would have been given to him. But he was asked by the men that looked over the top, whence came you and what would you have? And he answered, I have eaten and drunk in the presence of the king, and he has taught in our streets. Then they asked him for his certificate that they might go and show it to the king. So he fumbled in his bosom for one and found none. Then they said, have you none? But the man answered never a word. So they told the king, but he would not come down to see him, but commanded the two shining ones that conducted Christian and Hopeful into the city to go out and take ignorance and bind him hand and foot and have him away. Then they took him up and carried him through the air to the door that I saw on the side of the hill and put him in there. Then I saw that there was a way to hell even from the gates of heaven as well as from the city of destruction. It's a solemn reminder, that, to us, isn't it? There's a little hymn. In times like these, you need a Savior. Be very sure, be very sure, your anchor holds and grips the solid rock. That rock is Jesus. That rock is Jesus. False assumptions, minor consequences. But make a false assumption about this. Eternal consequences. So, dear friends, examine yourself and ask yourself this morning, can I say, my Jesus, my Savior, Lord, there is none like thee. Can you say that? Can you say that Jesus is your Savior, that he is your only hope 
in life and death, that He is the rock upon which your hopes are built. Today, please do not think you're a Christian or assume you're a Christian. Be very sure, be very sure. And today the invitation comes to receive Him as Savior and Lord. And the opportunity, if you want some help and advice, is to go on to the prayer room after the service and say, I'd like to know a bit more about this and begin that journey. We're never too old to start that journey. And it's never too late to start that journey. A journey with Christ through life, through death, and into his eternal presence forever and ever. The danger of making a false assumption. Let us pray together. Our loving Father, you so loved this world that you gave your only begotten Son. He said he did not come to condemn, but to save. And we bless you that we are still in the day of grace. We're still in a day when Jesus extends the invitation to come and to find rest for our souls in him, to come and to know our sins forgiven, to come and to receive the gift of life which is eternal. I pray that by the gracious work of your Holy Spirit, it might please you to work in all of our lives, that each of us might be sure, yes, be very sure, that our anchor holds and grips the solid rock, which is Jesus. And we ask it in his precious name. Amen. Our closing praise picks up this very theme, my hope is built on nothing less.
the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with you all now and forevermore. Amen.